Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Haidar. And let me also join the chorus of thanks for uh, Dr. Ellis and the team at Villanova University for making all of this possible, especially Nadia Barsoom, who's done a marvelous job. Thank you very much. Um, now, my contribution here uh, will echo to, to a good extent what uh, Dr. Midri has been saying and what has been also already in the discussion uh, earlier today. But what I will attempt to do is provide a human rights perspective uh, on the issues of protect protecting Christians and other minorities. Now, this human rights perspective does not stand on its own, for sure. And I don't think anything really stands on its own, whether you're talking about the legal analysis or a social analysis or a political analysis. It has to be seen, this human rights perspective, within the broader political and institutional context of the region, as well as the global frameworks for the protection of rights, which are, unfortunately, very weak and fundamentally political, even though we talk about human rights as human rights law. And um, let me start, I'll start by boring you a little bit with some enumeration of, of you know, what are the rights of minorities and what instruments, how human rights law deals with the question of, of minorities. Now, I have to remember that the human rights edifice, as we know it today, is built on a few very basic premises that cut across all of the treaties and the conventions. And indeed, it can be said that they form fundamental pillars of customary international law. These include the recognition of the common worth and dignity of all, and the principle of equality and non-discrimination on any basis. The very first article of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights of 1948 simply states that, quote, all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. They are endowed with reason and conscience and with reason and conscience and should act towards one another in a spirit of brotherhood. It proceeds in the second article to describe that the rights and entitlements enumerated in the declaration are to be enjoyed without distinction of any kind, such as race, color, sex, language, religion, political or other opinion, national or social origin, property, birth, or other status. Now, the rights of racial, ethnic, and religious, and other minorities are specifically protected in international human rights law as well, including the right to practice and teach their faith, preserve and teach language and cultural identity. We find this in Article 27 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights that guarantees the right to enjoy, guarantees minorities, the right to enjoy their own culture, to profess and practice their own religion, and to use their own language. Other human rights instruments rely on the more general provisions that prohibit discrimination and racism. Chief amongst those is the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination, which prohibits, in its first article, any distinction, exclusion, restriction, or preference Similarly, the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights stresses that those rights are to be enjoyed without discrimination of any kind as to, again, race, color, sex, language, religion, political or other opinion, national or social origin, property, birth, or other status. The Convention on the Rights of the Child also guarantees that any child member of a minority group shall not be denied the right to profess and practice his or her own religion or to use her, his or her own language. And there are many other such legal instruments, including international labor organization conventions and declarations that use similar language on non-discrimination. UNESCO is another very important player in, uh, you know, when you think about its declarations on cultural preservation that has also uh, important protections. The most ins important instruments, however, are three. First is the Genocide Convention, which was adopted one day before the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, which sets out, the Genocide Convention sets out to protect the very existence of minority groups 
and prohibits not only genocide, but, quote, serious bodily or mental harm and the deliberate infliction of conditions of life calculated to bring about the group's physical destruction in whole or in part. It's a very broad definition of genocide in the Convention. The second instrument is the 1992 Declaration on the Rights of Persons Belonging to National Ethnic, Religious, and Linguistic Minorities, which sets out in quite some detail the rights specific to such minorities and the special protections to which they are entitled, including protection of their very existence as well as the right to culture, language, association, free expression, and many others. The third, and the only one designed as a legal enforcement instrument, is the Rome Statutes of the International Criminal Court. The ICC has the authority to investigate and prosecute individuals for crimes of genocide, war crimes, and crimes against humanity. The list of crimes prosecutable by the court includes forced transfers of persons belonging to minorities, forced sterilizations, and rape as a war crime. Except for the International Criminal Court, which targets only individuals suspected of such crimes, the system has few teeth to deal with abusive policies beyond naming and shaming in the discussions of the Human Rights Council and the General Assembly or through the reports of human rights organizations. Yet naming and shaming rarely works, and usually only with states that may occasionally feel some shame, and those are indeed very, very few. The legal and political responsibility to protect the rights of minorities lies, of course, with the state, which has the authority and the power and is the responsible party to be held accountable. The scope of legal obligation is not only to refrain from violating a minority's rights, but also to protect it from such violation by others. It becomes, of course, much more difficult when the party that is the aggressor against minorities is an armed group that exercises some de facto jurisdiction over territory and people, but does not have legal recognition as an entity by the international community. In such a case, the obligation remains squarely on the shoulders of the state to protect minorities against the vagaries of such groups. However, when a state is unable or unwilling or is ineffective in providing such protection, the responsibility falls upon the international community as a whole. In fact, we are seeing this play out today in the case of Daesh, ISIL. Now, moving on from there, when it comes to the multiplicity of minority communities in the richly diverse Middle East and North Africa, we have serious failures to discharge such legal and moral responsibility with dire consequences that are reaching the levels of genocidal acts such as we're seeing in Iraq and Syria. The complexity of the current situation, in my view, cannot just be ascribed to assumed sectarian hostilities and age-old blood rivalries. Rather, I would point to the endemic instrumental use of sectarianism globally and by national autocratic leadership in the quest to maintain control of power and wealth. And here I'm, I'm echoing a bit, quite a bit of what you were saying, Dr. Mitri, that in the early 1800s, the Ottoman Tanzimat copied European constitutional and civil law in the effort to modernize and tried to strike a balance between giving Caesar what is Caesar's, i.e. demanding loyalty to the empire, and allowing the different religious and ethnic communities, the millets, a significant degree of autonomy over their religious and civil affairs. Now this resulted in a schism that was inherited by the Arab states between their penal and their civil code. 
laws, especially those that deal with most matters of personal status such as marriage, divorce, inheritance, adoption, and others. This created a duality of <clears throat> respecting minority differences and allowing the exercise of community prerogatives on the one hand, and on the other, differentiation between the legal status of individual members of those communities at the expense of equality of citizenship. It created obstacles in many aspects of life for minorities, including intercommunal marriages and adoptions, and affected the laws of nationality in all states of the region as well. This system persists today, and the best example is Lebanon, with its 17 or 18 legally recognized confessional communities and the absence of a civil law for marriage, for example. After the First World War and the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, colonial powers viewed the region with a sectarian lens, even as they worked to progressively structure their own societies on the basis of the rule of law and equality of citizenship. They often pitted communities against one another, favoring one over the other, and threatening the delicate tapestry of intercultural and interreligious coexistence that kept a modicum of peace and relative security, imperfect and problematic as it was. Examples abound from dividing the entire Arab Gulf in accordance with perceived tribal homogeneity and loyalties to the creation of a Jewish Israel upon the ruination of a more diverse Palestine, the Sykes-Picot Treaty and the attempt to create a Christian Lebanon, disallowing a Kurdistan and many more. The early process of state formation in the Arab region produced kings and emirs who governed their nascent states in an authoritarian and autocratic, autocratic way as though by divine right. And they continue to do so today. Peoples who did revolt against colonialism and overthrew both colonial powers or monarchies, as they did in Iraq, Egypt, Syria, and Algeria, also produced governance systems and presidents that governed in much the same way as the kings and emirs did. They publicly espoused an Arab nationalism and unity that rejected diversity and multiculturalism in favor of an assumed Arab slash Islamic hegemony. Like the colonial powers before them, they continued to use tribalism and sectarianism to maintain their power and authority. In both republics and monarchies, such divisions were used to concentrate power and wealth in the hands of a few at the expense of equality and equal access to resources. <coughs> Another factor that some point to is the assumed contradiction arising from the uneasy relationship between the constitutional and legal constructs of a state in the modern era and the Islamic concept of the ummah and the attendant and its attendant laws based on sharia. Indeed, the constitutions of most states in the region do state clearly that Islam is the religion of the state and that sharia is the primary, if not the only, source of legislation. Sharia laws, however, are as variously interpretable as there are states, and as are the perceptions and treatment of non-Islamic minorities. There is plenty of evidence to suggest that this has resulted in discrimination against minorities, yes, and I would mention here by way of example the Egyptian and Saudi limitations on the building of churches and the non-recognition and at times outright persecution of the Baha'i communities, as was mentioned earlier today. Such endemic discrimination, however, does not sufficiently explain the magnitude of recent events in Iraq, Syria, Palestine, elsewhere around the region. The Christian minorities are indeed in danger in the Levant, 
But so are, in various degrees, the Shia in Bahrain and Saudi Arabia, the Yazidis in Iraq, the Sunnis in Iran and Iraq, and the Baha'is everywhere. They are all in need of protection, and the human rights approach demands that they are protected equally and without discrimination. Yet it appears far easier for the West, if we can say that, to have empathy with beleaguered Christians than with others. The US Congress is ready to express its concern for persecuted Christians and sets up a religious freedom index for that purpose than they are for the persecuted Shia of Bahrain, for example, or the Rohingya Muslims in Myanmar today. For years, the civil war in Sudan was portrayed as one between the perceived Arab Muslim North versus the Christian and animist South. No sooner had the Sudan split into two countries, another civil war broke out between rival Christians in the new South Sudan. So is it about the religion and religious freedom, or is it, is it about power and wealth? In my view, particular attention to protection of Christians more than others can be problematic. It sets them apart and may privilege them more than other persecuted minorities. It, further, it furthers sectarian divisions within those societies and undermines the fundamental principle of achieving equality and equal rights for all. The danger is that such discriminatory protection, if we can call it that, confirms for many in the region that the international community that espouses equality and non-discrimination and respect for human rights, in fact, has a double standard and believes that some people are indeed more equal than others. Everyone needs protection, and every minority that is persecuted needs to be protected and saved equally. This is not to deny that at different times, different minority groups are victimized in particularly vicious or brutal ways. But I would stress that in advocating for the protection of each particular community, whether it is the Tutsis of Rwanda in the 1990s, or the Christians or Yazidis in Iraq, or the Muslims of Myanmar, we don't lose sight of the overarching human rights requirement that all must be protected. If the international community mobilizes to protect the Christians of Iraq, for example, it cannot be just because they are Christian. And it should not exclude Yazidis and others. Another example is Palestine, where the number of Christians, as we have heard from Dr. Yusuf, where the number of Christians has been rapidly diminishing. But that is because of a military occupation that brutalizes all Palestinians, Muslim and Christian alike. The protection of Christians there must be seen in the context of protecting all Palestinians. No people in the world has a monopoly on racism and ethnic and religious discrimination. And sectarianism is not a phenomenon limited to the Middle East or unique to it but a global one. There has been ample historical documentation of persecution and discrimination against religious and ethnic minorities all over the globe, from genocide against the indigenous populations of North and South America, to that of the Jews and Roma in Europe, to religious and ethnic cleansing in the Balkans and Rwanda, to the persecution of the Rohingya Muslims today. We are also seeing a frightening rise in Islamophobia in Europe and North America, which is going hand in hand with anti-Semitism and rejection of all minorities there, including refugees. Human rights principles and their treaties and conventions do offer an approach that seeks to provide protection of religious and other minorities on the basis of the inherent dignity of all humanity. International advocacy can rely on human rights texts and on the mechanisms available in the international legal system. However, we can be victim, we cannot be victim of the illusion 
that simply because we have those agreements that states and armed groups will implement them. They certainly will not do so against their will. But armed with those principles, what we need is mobilization and advocacy that uses a holistic approach to include an understanding of the political economy of repression and brutality, including the utilitarian approach to sectarianism, including the arms industry and what it is doing globally, including relationship between power, wealth, and faith, if you will. We need a long view of history and a clear vision of a future where we can all be equal and equally protected. Thank you very much.